Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm very happy that uh, you are joining us for this uh, Euro webinar from uh, the European Association of Urology. And it is, it is my great uh, pleasure today to do this webinar with my uh, good friend, Dr. Pale Oster from uh, Denmark. And as you already know, we will talk together regarding flexible ureteroscopy in terms of uh, instrumentation, guidelines, indications, uh, tips and tricks, and some uh, notes uh, regarding uh, laser technology. So I would like to uh, remember you that uh, we have two talks, uh, 20 minutes each. At the end of uh, each talk, it's possible to uh, have questions for 10 minutes. Uh, and uh, this uh, webinar is uh, accredited, so you will receive the CME uh, credits after the, the webinar uh, uh, when you complete uh, the questionnaire. So now we will start with uh, Dr. Pale Oster. And Pale, uh, you will talk uh, about uh, indications, equipment, and guidelines. Thank you, Pale. Thanks, uh, Olivier, and uh, welcome to all of you to this uh, ESU webinar on flex ureteroscopy. Uh, These are my disclosures. In flexible ureteroscopy, there has been a tremendous technological development during recent years, and with a flexible ureteroscope, it's possible to do almost anything in the upper tract. However, everything that can be done doesn't necessarily should be done. And in surgery, this equation aiming at perfection is nice to remember. Perfection equals efficacy multiplied with 10 times safety, telling us that efficacy should have a robust foundation on safety. And we shouldn't push indications too far, ending in a situation like this, stone-free, but in a very poor condition. And in my talk today, I would very much like to take the pathophysiological perspective of flexible ureteroscopy. Well, helping us taking the right, uh, help, helping us taking the right decision for our patients, we have our European guidelines. And let's take a look at these. This is how they looked in 2011, and it is clear that Shockwell literacy had a very prominent position in almost any stone situation, except for the large stones. However, what happened in the clinical practice in Europe around that time? This is data from Peter Alton's center in Mannheim, Germany, clearly showing that Shockwell literacy activity went down and ureteroscopic stone management went up dramatically. And exactly the same trend was seen in most other European centers when we had the uh, guidelines, as you see on the left. So clearly, we were going beyond the guidelines. So what happened next to the guidelines? Well, in 2017, the guidelines were changed and they are still valid in 2020. And these updated guidelines, and in these updated guidelines, endourology has moved up to number one position in all stone scenarios. The question is, however, whether this transition is evidence-based, and the short answer is that it is not. This transition is not based on high-level evidence. This transition is mainly technology driven. And there's nothing wrong with this. And I will argue this. Because stone disease is so diverse that it's impossible to have every clinical scenario flanked by high level evidence and the other aspects of evidence-based medicine, individual clinical expertise, that is, what works in your hands and patients' values and expectations become especially important. And we are now in the fortunate situation that technology has given us the tools to approach 
evidence-based medicine in a personalized way. In other, way, in other words, uh, we have now moved into the era of PSA, personalized stone approach. And with the technology available, scopes, lasers, disposables, etc., it's possible to select the right patient for the right treatment. Ladies and gentlemen, we have now reached tomorrow. To approach the patient in a balanced, personalized way, there are a lot of aspects to consider, including stone characteristics, kidney characteristics, and overall patient characteristics. Let's have a look at a couple of cases. This is a 75-year-old man with severe comorbidity. Some years ago, he had a drug eluding stent inserted. And as you see, he has a partial stack horn in a horseshoe kidney. Well, looking at our guidelines, they recommend us that such a large stone should be treated with PCNL. However, due to the drug eluding stent that he has inserted, the patient was on clopidogrel, which the cardiologist didn't want to discontinue, making PCNL less attractive. So what to do? The literature tells us that it is safe to do retrograde intrarenal surgery without discontinuing anticoagulant medication. So personalizing the approach to this patient, uh, the, this patients were treated by flexible ureteroscopy. Of course, you will have to inform him that the procedure may be staged. Uh, this is another uh, case. This is a 47 year old woman with a large stone in the left kidney, Poundsfield unit. 1084. She had a normal uh, kidney function. According to the guidelines, this is an ideal case for PCNL. However, looking at the perirenal anatomy, the colon is positioned uh, retrorenal, which actually happens in 16% of cases on the left side. And this increases the risk of colon perforation during PCNL access and the patient was addressed in a personalized way by flexible ureteroscopy to balance efficacy and safety. And in fact, this case was treated in only one session and the patient was stone free. Indeed, due to technological advancement, it has become safe and feasible to approach large and complex renal and ureteric calculi by flexible ureteroscopy as shown in this paper by Michael Grassel's group. However, when addressing such large stones, patients should be advised that the procedure may have to be staged, as is also documented in this paper. And this is perfectly in line within the framework of evidence-based medicine, taking individual clinical expertise and patients' preferences into account. Well, performing flexible ureteroscopy involves several aspects related to access, irrigation, stone treatment, and drainage. However, equally important are preoperative considerations, which we did touch upon in the cases, and not least, attitude. Attitude, when performing flexible ureteroscopy, you necessarily have to travel through the ureter and the ureter is a thin walled delicate organ with a small lumen in which excessive force may be disastrous for the patient. So leave your inner gorilla outside the operating room. This is not part of the instrumentation. You have to realize that endurologists are the most gentle people in the world. It is you're performing ureteroscopy. It's like handling a butterfly, which afterwards should be able to fly unrestrictedly, just like the ureter should be able to transport urine unrestrictedly after you have performed a ureteroscopy. Remembering that the ureter doesn't easily forgive you. Well, performing ureterorhinoscopy and retrograde interrenal surgery, there are some crucial steps to consider. Should I perform a retrograde pyelography? Should I place a safety guide? guide wire? Should I dilate ureteral orifice? Or should I use an axis sheet? How should I irrigate? 
And what about stone retrieval and ureteral stent uh, placement? I will discuss with you some of these crucial issues. It is a must to have x-ray available when performing ureteroscopy. However, is it necessary to do a retrograde pyelography? Probably not. There's no evidence in the literature. Personally, I like to do it because it gives you an idea of the dynamic anatomy of the upper tract that's, that, as you see in this slide, is very different from patient to patient. Even normal anatomy is very different, uh, is very diverse. Regarding safety guide wire, our guidelines clearly state that in ureteroscopy, placement of a safety wire is recommended. However, evidence is low. This uh, recommendation is upgraded based on panel consensus. It's based on the clinical experience that few of us have ever regretted placing a safety wire. And why do we do it? Because of safety, of course. However, flexible uteroscopy can be done without a safety wire. This has been shown in several publications. So it's for you to decide. However, we do recommend to play it the safe way. The next question, should I dilate the ureteral orifice? Well, with modern ureteroscopes, this almost is never necessary. And the recommendation, the recommendation is really to be reluctant dilating the normal ureters, ureters with rod dilators or with balloons. In fact, balloons are for birthdays, not for normal ureters. Instead, if the scope cannot be passed through a narrow ureter, it is advisable to place a JJ stent and come back later. What happens when you place a JJ stent is that the kidney looks at it as a chronic obstruction. And in response to that, pacemaker cell activity at the kidney collegial junctions and in the proximal ureter is, downreg is downregulated and peristalsis stops. And the ureter is transformed into uh, a, an adynamic, adynamic tube that subsequently may be passed by axis sheet and a scope. Axis sheets come in different designs, different sizes and lengths. However, they do represent a double-edged sword. On one hand, they reduce intrarenal pressure, thereby reducing potential septic complications. On the other hand, they carry a greater risk of strain-induced renal uh, strain-induced ureteral lesions, which was documented in this paper by Traxair and Thomas, using 12-14 French ureteral axis sheets. We recently showed that by reducing the size of the axis sheets to 10-12 French, risk of renal, of risk of ureteral injuries, of course, is reduced significantly. And with regard to ureteral axis, smaller sizes matters, and it's advisable to use the smallest axis sheet that is compatible with your ureteroscope, securing reasonable drainage along the scope. Well, regarding irrigation, the simplest way is to use irrigation by gravity, and then the intrarenal pressure will not exceed the water column. Or you may use a pressure-controlled pump, which is preferred by some, very useful, or I would say almost a must, is some kind of device that may be operated by foot or the hand for on-demand flushing to secure vision during dusting and fragmenting. However, when you pass a ureteroscope and irrigate, you will transform the upper tract from physiology to pathophysiology. Just passing the scope up the ureter will increase intrarenal pressure which will increase further when irrigating. And if the pressure rises above 30 to 40 millimeters of mercury, this will result in tubular, venous, and lymphatic backflow with potential risk of septic complications. If the pressure rises even further, initial rupture may occur, resulting in bleeding and peripelvic extravasation. Additionally, in response to increased pressures, uh, in response to increased pressures, the pelvic, the pelvic ball will distend, resulting in strain-induced activity in pacemaker cells, leading to peristalsis. 
which may result in access related complications. And in this way, increased intrarenal pressure is the main determinant for both septic and access related complications during ureteral rhinoscopy. Therefore, it is definitely advisable to irrigate as low as possible, ensuring reasonable vision during the procedure. So what about stone retrieval? Well, in my practice, I leave it to a minimum, dusting the major part of the stone and extracting, extracting the bigger fragments for analysis. And these are the devices you need, a tipless nitinol basket and a graspa-like basket as the end gates or the decoder, which are especially, especially useful for repositioning uh, stones from the lower calyx to the upper or middle calyx for subsequent management. Doing this will both protect the scopes from damage and increase efficacy as showed in the study by Schuster and co-workers. However, with the smaller fibers available nowadays, I increasingly, in fact, I in fact increasingly treat the stones in situ. When should uh, you place a post-procedural stent? Well, our guidelines tells us that stenting is optional after uncomplicated URS. And why should we place a stent? Uh, why shouldn't we always place a stent? Because stenting has inborn morbidity that impact quality of life significantly. And you may be guided by the pulse, the posterioroscopic uh, lesion scale published by Schoenthal and co-workers, inspecting the ureter after the procedure and grading the lesions and then stent accordingly. If the lesions go beyond the mucosa, and also lesion grade uh, may be guided uh, by a lesion, the, the, the length of, stented, uh, of st the stenting period may be uh, guided uh, by the pulse uh, uh, system. While stenting is optional in uncomplicated URS, post-procedural stenting is mandatory after endophilotomy, endoureterotomy, after laser ablation of ureteral tumors in case of significant uh, residual material, and of course, in case of significant injury to the ureter, following treatment of impacted ureteral stones, and after prolonged rear procedures with uses of large sized URS, this is what we call complicated ureteroscopy. Which stents to use is not well documented in the literature, although some studies have shown that silicone stent and string stents are more accepted by the patients. Further data uh, is needed, however. Conclusively, flexible ureterinoscopy can be done in several ways using different kinds of instrumentations. And as long as you keep it safe, in endurology, there is no such thing as never and no such thing as always. The way to go is personalizing the approach, tailoring instrumentation to the individual case. Thanks. This, is, uh, this slide just summarizes some of the take home messages and I will be uh, happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Palais. Uh, excellent talk. Um, we have a few questions for you. So, France, a uh, question regarding the guidelines, uh, Palais. If we have a yeah. look regarding the American guidelines and the European guidelines, uh, we have some differences for stone uh, less than two centimeters, uh, and especially because uh, European guidelines recommend uh, for stone, kidney stone, between one to two centimeters uh, shockwave or PCNL or flexi. And if you have a look with the American guidelines, they recommend flexible or shockwave litotripsy. So how do you explain that the American uh, guidelines don't recommend actually PCNL for stone less than two. Well, uh, one reason could be that, that the miniaturized PCNL is not really uh, well distributed in, in, in the US. The way I see it right now is that we shouldn't just be looking at the size of the stone. As I said, we should, we should be much more personalized because it's not just the size of the stone, it's the anatomy, it's the comorbidity, it's the way the stone appear 
uh, is it a very hard uh, homogeneous stone or is it a, a, a inhomogeneous uh, heterogeneous stone? We, we can very often go with flexible gyroscopy even in very large uh, in, in, in very large stones and also chocolate can be performed in larger stone if, if it's with the stones are heterogeneous. So we should not just look at size, we should look at all the other parameters, uh, stone characteristics, renal characteristics, and patient's characteristics. Yeah, I think you're totally right, uh, Palais. And I think when we are talking about size, uh, in fact, uh, it would be better also to talk about the total volume of the stone. Yeah, uh, exactly. And especially when we do uh, flexi uh, using uh, laser technology, we will, we will talk about that later. But I think it's much better to evaluate the total volume and the unsealed yeah. unit for uh, for the, the resistance of the stone. Yeah, totally right. Yeah, um, Pale, we have we have another question regarding the prophylactic antibiotics yeah. uh, for flexible ureteroscopy. What do you recommend? Well, we actually use because I, as I said to you before, we will experience um, uh, backflow, intrarenal uh, backflow to the veins and to the lymphatics uh, uh, at a very low uh, uh, pressure. And therefore we use uh, uh, prophylactic antibiotics in every case. Um, and of course, if, if we, we shouldn't do it if we have, an, uh, if the patient is actively infected, we should treat the patient first uh, uh, according to the culture. I know there has been a, um, a um, this, uh, the CROSS study, on flexible ureteroscopy, showing that uh, that, is, that that there was no difference in post-operative infections uh, if you did prophylactic antibiotic or if you, uh, or if you didn't. However, I think this is uh, this study actually has uh, a lot of uh, a lot of bias. So, so my recommendation is to use prophylactic antibiotics in every case of flexible ureteroscopy. Okay, and, and Palais, uh, personal question, if, if you have a patient with a, a urinary infection, so you treat the patient before, yeah. and then you come back again with a, a new uh, urine culture, and it's still positive, and you treat again, and still positive, you know, so, so some kind of patient with a double G uh, in place, yeah. very difficult to, opt to um, uh, obtain yeah. a sterile uh, pre-op urine culture. What, what do yes. you do in this situation? I think we will have to differentiate between having an active infection or being colonized because of the JJ stand or because of, of, of an, an infection stone. Or uh, I, I think in these cases, if the patient is not actively infected, uh, but still have a positive culture, it's, it is possible to do a flexible ureteroscopy under appropriate uh, antibiotic uh, treatment. Okay, perfect. Uh, another question is regarding retrograde pilography, because you said yeah. this is one step during the procedure. And the question is, do we really need to do it systematically as, a, as an, uh, an obligation for each patient? Or? No, I, I, I don't think we need to do it systematically. Um, I just said that this was my preference because I like to see the dynamic, uh, di the dynamic anatomy. But there's actually absolutely no evidence, and and I I, sh I wouldn't advocate that we need to do it systematically. Um, okay. If you have some suspicion that, uh, that that something is going on, for instance, in the ureter or some special anatomy, uh, it, it's definitely definitely advisable uh, to to do it. Uh, I, I don't always, I, I know that somebody, uh, that some who is doing always a rigid uh, ureteroscopy before every flexible ureteroscopy, I don't do that. Uh, 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 sometimes I do it if I have some suspicion that something is happening in, in the ureter, but if I'm not doing the, the rigid ureteroscopy, it's nice to have, uh, at least I think, to have uh, uh, a retrograde study to see that everything is okay there. Yeah, I agree with you, eh, Pale. I think it's very important to, if you need to know ab about the anatomy, you need to be ready to inject some contrast and to obtain the, the, the pictures. And, and most of the time, if the patient uh, before the surgery uh, realize um, a Euro CT scan, so I mean a CT scan with contrast, uh, then we have an idea about the anatomy. So if we already yeah. know the anatomy, then there's no obligation to do it. Uh, no, no. To do 
phylography systematically. Okay. Uh -huh. Another question, uh, Pale, uh, is regarding irrigation. Yeah. And the question is, uh, what is the most practical uh, system to irrigate for flexi uh, ureteroscopy? What do you recommend? Uh, well, uh, well, it's. Uh, I think that there, there are personal preferences here, and, and this, this is perfectly okay. I I actually recommend to have. Um, you can you can perfectly uh, well do a, a gravity irrigation with on-demand flushing. With the, in fact, uh, Mr. Professor Trachet, I use the Trachet flow because I like that. But there are other systems available that is that is nice. I think it's mandatory to have on-demand flushing, uh, especially with these uh, uh, high-power lasers that in which in which you are dusting uh, to to have things uh, the operation go on rather quickly. It's 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 uh, it's necessary to have these. So so okay. gravity irrigation is perfectly or to have, uh, or you can have a pump. I, I, there are personal, personal preference. I, I don't think we can give a, a sort of a straight answer here. And, and you know, there's many, many questions on, and concern regarding this uh, automatic pump, actually. There's yeah. a lot of debates. People, they're really happy to have this pump to irrigate with very high pressure, you know, up to yeah. 200, 200 millimeters of mercury. W no, what no. is your opinion regarding this uh, kind of system? No, 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 no. We, we, we should we should keep uh, the, the pressure low, and and if you are using pump, you should set set the pressure to to, to very low below below around forty to sixty or something like that, or even uh, and but 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 if you are using gravity, you always know the pressure. They have the water column, and then you can increase. Uh, the, then you can flush for, for, for vision. So so don't don't have your your um, your pump set very high. You should have it very low. Okay. Another question regarding also your lateral access. Um, you said that if you failed, you, you have to place a double G. So somebody is asking you, but if you put a double G to pre-stand, how long do you have to wait? Well, I, I don't think you have to wait. Uh, I, I, you, you can do oh, it after days. a week or after a few days, actually, because because what happens is that actually the kidney uh, looks at the at the stent as as a, a chronic of, like a chronic obstruction, and when when the kidney is slightly obstructed, the pacemaker cells stops uh, firing, and then you will have an adynamic. Uh, uh, the ureter will be turned into an adynamic tube. And this, this happens after three to four days or something like that. Okay. And then we have also a question regarding the, the ureteral access sheet, a very special one. The name is the Clear Petra ureteral yeah. access sheet. Just, just for the people who, who don't know the Clear Petra, it's, it's a, a ureteral access sheet. It's also possible to put something to aspirate through yeah. this access sheet supposed to be uh, efficient to aspirate the, the small fragments and the dust. It exists for PCNL, yes. uh, but it's also available for flexible ureteroscopy. What is your opinion regarding this system? Well, uh, I, I have some issues uh, about it. If, if, if you, you have to, you, you attract your, your scope and then you aspirate and then you, then if, if you, you need to have uh, the stone very very dusted. Otherwise, you will have you 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 risk having small fragments alongside uh, the scope and the access sheet. This is one concern. Uh, but honestly speaking, I cannot uh, give you. Uh, I don't have very much experience with this, but I do have in my mind some concerns about it in ureteroscopy. It works excellently in PCML. Yeah. I, I, I totally, totally agree with you, Pale. I have exactly the same experience. Uh, the system works very well um, for PCNL, or if you do uh, some uh, bladder, uh, bladder stone, because there is also a system available for bladder stone. Yeah. But I think for flexi, it, it's a bit more, more tricky and uh, more, more difficult. Okay. Yeah. Uh, maybe we have still one minute, um, uh, Pale. So we have a last question regarding the 
um, complication uh, of flexible ureteroscopy. What yeah. is your personal uh, definition of uncomplicate? So it means the situation where you personally don't place a double G at the end because you are thinking there's no need for that. What is the criteria, your personal criteria on that? Well, I, if, if, I, if I'm absolutely sure uh, that, um, that, that, that there's no uh, residual stone mass, only very fine dust, this procedure has not been uh, very prolonged, below uh, one hour, and at, I had absolutely no access uh, problems. Um, and also, if I have not used a large access sheet, then I could, uh, then I will consider not to stand. Okay, very clear. Thank you, Pale. It was a great talk. It was Thank you. Uh, really nice to discuss with you these uh, questions, really. Uh, so now I will give my I will give my talk on uh, flexi and laser. Um, we have only twenty minutes, so it's I must say it's a bit uh, it's a bit short <clears throat> to discuss um, uh, tips and tricks. So I decided to talk a little bit more regarding laser technology. As you know, we have this new uh, new uh, technology coming uh, since a uh, few few weeks, um, tulium fiber laser. So what I would like to do tonight is to come back first on holmium, holmium yak technology. It's still a fantastic technology. We, can, we, we should not forget. Uh, and then we will move to the, the tulium fiber one. Uh, my disclosure, so regarding uh, laser technology, I'm a consultant for some, uh, some companies, so don't forget that. Um, I like to remember, it's a very classical slide for me, but I think it's good sometimes to to look uh, uh, back and to remember uh, why do we name uh, Almium and Tulium. And it comes from this uh, Swedish uh, person. He was a mineralogist and uh, he was the first uh, to describe uh, Almium and Tulium element. And then he used uh, the Latin uh, word of Stockholm, Olmia, to name Almium. Uh, and uh, Tule, it's in Greek, and it means uh, Scandinavia. Huh? The, the reason why we are using today Holmium and Tulium. Laser is light, there's no need to, to come back on, on, on that. And we know that when we are using laser, we are using a light, it's a very special light, but it's light. Even we cannot see it since it's into the, the infrared spectrum, but don't forget you are lose, uh, using light. And when I say don't forget, for me, the main message is when we are using light, light can burn can burn a uh, tissue. And this is why uh, laser can be dangerous in endourology. Regarding the, the laser technology, a long time ago, uh, Isner uh, described the Moses effect. The Moses effect is what you can see actually on this video. And it explains, it's, it's a little bit a complex mechanism, but it explains why this light is able to break stones and also to treat urotelial tumor and, and, and stenosis. Uh, the Moses uh, effect is very well known and it's associated with pulsed laser. The first use, the first report in neurology using Holmium Yak uh, was uh, by Dr. Johnson and it was in 1992. Uh, so you see it's more than 30 years, more or less, that we are using actually uh, Holmium Yak. And of course, today in 2020, Holmium Yak is considered as the gold standard. We can treat uh, any kind of stones, we can ablate urotelial tumor, we can treat, treat the stenosis, we can coagulate. And with high power system, we can also treat the BPH. So this is really a, a, a fantastic tool for endourology. Two different Holmium Yak laser, the low power and high power. What does it mean? It means that when you are using a low power system, you are using a system with only one cavity, a laser cavity. And because it's only one cavity, it's limited to 30 watts. If you are using high power system, you are using a system with multiple 
laser cavities. And the reason why it's possible to have much more power. The question is, do we need uh, such high power when we do endourology stones? The main benefit, if you compare the two technologies, the low and the high power, is regarding the frequency. I mean, the number of pulses per second. Uh, if you look uh, at the energy, the energy level is exactly the same. But the benefit of high power is related to this high frequency, more pulses per second. So you are supposed to go much faster when you are using holmium yag high power system. Uh, it's not clearly demonstrated, but it's supposed to be the, the benefit. Recently, uh, relatively recently, Luminis introduced the MOSIS technology. What does it mean? MOSIS technology is not exactly the MOSIS effect. Uh, if we summarize, we can say that the MOSIS technology is one particular MOSIS effect. Uh, we don't know exactly today, it's not clearly demonstrated, at least clinically, clinically demonstrated, the superiority of this technology. But we must say that when Luminis introduced the MOSIS technology, they introduced a new concept for us, and this concept is the pulse modulation. And we will probably have, in, in the future, more uh, system with this pulse modulation. Regarding Ramium Yag, we said before it's a pulsed laser, so it means that we have to fix the parameters in terms of energy, in joules, and this is the first that you have to fix, frequency, so the number of pulses per second, uh, and the pulse duration. Uh, each pulse can be short or can be long, and of course you need to know when you need short or when you need long pulse. So today, uh, again, with Holmium Yag technology, we more or less, we know what we need to uh, set in terms of uh, parameters. And for example, for dusting, we recommend to use long pulse with low energy and high frequency. For fragmentation, we recommend the opposite, short pulse, high energy, low frequency. If you're using the popcorn technique, it's a combination of long pulse, high energy, low frequency. I must say that it's not completely uniform. Huh? If you ask different experts, um, some differences. Huh? So it means that it's, uh, there's no uh, a complete consensus regarding the, the, the setting of uh, the laser. Um, just one, um, one uh, trick regarding the dusting, uh, I think it's uh, something we, we, you have to do if you would like to produce a nice uh, dust. Uh, we recommend actually to move all the time at the surface of the stone and don't touch, don't touch the, the stone. Uh, we, we call this technique the painting technique. Uh, and this is actually the best uh, to produce a, a very uh, thin uh, dust. Uh, not always easy to do, but this is actually what we recommend. So to uh, increase this uh, painting uh, um, technique, we recommend, of course, to move the scalp at the surface of the, of the stone by using uh, the classical rotation of the, the, of the endoscope. But we also recommend to use what we call the micro rotation. It's a very precise movement that you can do with your left hand just by rotating the endoscope in between your fingers. Very nice to complete a, a nice uh, dusting. Another recommendation is also regarding uh, the position of the stone. If the stone is located into the kidney, you have a lot of space and you have low risk to damage the mucosa. So we recommend in this case to start from the surface and to move to the center of the, of the stone and you can use high frequency to go relatively fast. But be careful into the ureter, you have no space around the stone. So if you start from the surface, there's a big risk to damage the mucosa of the ureter. So we don't recommend the same. We recommend for ureteral stone to start from the center and to move to the surface from inside to outside and to use low frequency. If you're using low frequency, you have less pulses per second 
you have a better control and less risk to damage the ureter. And it's exactly the same recommendation actually for tulium fiber laser. In terms of laser incision, we recommend to use a long pulse with uh, some energy, 1.2 to 2 joules, uh, according to the system you are using, and relatively medium frequency, uh, 10 to 20 hertz. If you set the laser like this, you will be able to, to make a nice uh, incisions, uh, for example, for endopilotomy. Some take on messages regarding Holmiomiag laser. Regarding the fibers size, we recommend to use the small one, uh, 200 to 270 micron. If you use the small one, you will have exactly the same efficiency compared to a bigger one. You have more flexibility, you have more irrigation, and of course, less reed propulsion. And as you know, reed propulsion is really a problem actually for laser technology, uh, and especially if we are using big fiber. So don't use big fiber, use the small one. If you're using too much energy, so if you have uh, a lot of reed propulsion, uh, decrease the energy level and then you will have less retropulsion. And select also at the same time a long pulse duration right? because we know that short pulse is associated with uh, retropulsion. Regarding the, the damage of the fiber, um, when you activate the laser, you damage the laser fiber. So we recommend to um, decrease, to limit this damage, to use actually high frequency, uh, low, freq low energy, sorry with long pulse duration, uh, and especially if we have uh, to treat a uh, heart stone. Regarding the tip of the fiber, you know that uh, it comes with a, a transparent tip, but it's actually demonstrated that if you cut the transparent tip, uh, the efficiency of the fiber is exactly the same. So I would say it's up to you. If you like to use the transparent tip, you can use it. Uh, if you don't like it because it's not really visible, you can cut the transparent tip and then efficiency will be exactly the same. So this is just to summarize our Holmiomiag uh, technology, but we, we need also to say, actually, we need to admit that we have some limitations with Holmiomiag, and especially uh, regarding the time. It's a time-consuming procedure, especially when we are treating big stones. And we have also the problem of the fragments. At the end, even we are using dusting parameters we need to uh, admit that at the end, we have still a lot of fragments and it's difficult to make these fragments smaller and smaller. So if we think about uh, a perfect instrument to replace Holmium Yag, uh, and we say, what do we need really for the future? We need definitively a new instrument to go finer, to, to produce smaller pieces. And of course, at the same time, to go faster. So if we think about finer, why do we need finer uh, particle? First, remember that we have no clear definitions actually about dust and fragments. For fragments, you can say less than one, less than two millimeters. But what, what about the dust? Nobody knows exactly what is the definition. So um, in my institution, we, we, we try to define what is dust. So we, we use specific parameters and actually for us, the dust means particles less than 250 microns. Why did we put this limit of 250? Just because if the particles are less than 250, you can obtain a floating effect, and then the dust evacuates by itself. The second point, if you consider particles less than 250, it's possible to completely aspirate these particles through the working channel of Uflexi and Oscar. So that's why we, we decided to put this limit of 250 microns. Now, if we consider to produce smaller pieces, what can we do? If we would like to go smaller, it seems clear that we have to use smaller fiber. But due to the laser technology, if we are using smaller fiber, we need also to use less energy inside to keep the same energy density. It's a very basic uh, principle. So let's take an example between two fibers, 270 and 150. If we compare, the diameter decreased by 1.8, but the cross-section by 3.3. So in terms of energy, 
if we are using 0.3 joule with the 270 micron fiber, we are supposed to use three times less 0.1 joule with the smaller fiber. If we do that, we keep exactly the same energy density. It actually clearly demonstrates that if you decrease the size of the fiber, but at the same time you decrease the energy uh, per pulse, you will obtain smaller pieces. So this is something we have to uh, accept. And of course now we need to think about faster. How is it possible to go faster actually? Relatively easy. If you have more pulses, more frequency, you go much faster. Again, it's a very uh, basic uh, principle. So if we summarize, we need a new system able to use smaller fiber, like 150, for example, or maybe smaller, with low energy, able to produce low energy, and at the same time, to produce very high frequency to compensate and to go faster. If we consider these three points, unfortunately, holmium yak is not the laser that we are waiting for. Since uh, recently, a new system was introduced, the Tullium Fiber Laser. It's a pulse laser again, and it's nothing compared to Halmium. Now we are talking about a, a system with a very long fiber, 10 to 13 meters. The center is very transparent, 10 microns, and inside we put Tullium element. If you do this, you obtain a Tullium Fiber Laser. And to activate the system, we connect diode laser, multiple one, to activate the system. At the end of this system, you connect surgical laser fiber. So now if we compare the two technologies, again, they are completely different. So if we look at the wavelength, for example, Holmium Yak is in the infrared spectrum, 2,100 nanometers, completely absorbed in uh, water. But if we compare the tulium fiber, it's also in the infrared spectrum. Now it's 1,940 nanometers, so it's very close. But as you can see, it's 4.5 times more absorbed in uh, water. If we look at the pulse energy, the maximum is the same, 6 joules, but we don't really need 6 joules. But the minimum is 10 times less for uh, tulium fiber. If we look at the peak power, the peak power is really something essential, actually. The peak power of tulium fiber is four times less compared to holmium. Very important to decrease retropulsion and to uh, damage less the laser fiber. If we look at the frequency, 25 times more with uh, tulium fiber compared to holmium. And that's the comparison between holmium and Tulium fiber, and as you can see, very high frequency possible with the Tulium fiber. It was uh, already published that we can use this high frequency, completely feasible. Uh, and regarding the size of the fiber that we can connect, you know that for Holmium Yag, we are limited to 200, 270. With Tulium fiber, in theory, it's possible to connect very small fiber up to 50 microns. Actually, uh, only 150 microns are available. And it's possible to do this because the laser beam profile of the tulium fiber is 16 times smaller. So the reason why we can connect at the, the system very, very small fiber. Holmium Yag, you are limited to 200. Tulium fiber, up to 50 microns. It was demonstrated uh, uh, recently that when we're using smaller fiber, we produce smaller pieces, exactly what we said before. So if we compare again, uh, tulium fiber and holmium yak, regarding the definition of the dust that we fixed before, 250 micron, uh, it's possible to obtain this with any kind of stone with tulium fiber compared to uh, holmium yak. Just an example. You see, it's a, an in vitro uh, a demo with the tulium fiber. We are using very high frequency, 1,000 hertz. Uh, and as you can see that it's really, really uh, thin particles and it's going really, really faster. It's in the lab, of course. Uh, we, we, we will have to demonstrate this also in the, the clinical, uh, in the real life. 
Uh, it was uh, demonstrated by many, many teams, actually, the superiority of the trillium fiber compared to holmium, modest and much faster. I think that's what you can actually uh, remember. So this trillium fiber laser seems to be actually the ideal equipment to go finer and to go faster. Exactly what we said before. Okay, regarding retropulsion, we need also to mention, and, and it's already published by many, many people, that uh, tulium fiber is associated with less retropulsion compared to holmium. So this is really a, a benefit. Uh, we have also additional benefits regarding the damage of the, of the surgical fiber. We have less uh, burn back when we are using tulium fiber compared to holmium yag. I mentioned before, it's in, in part, it's due to the low peak power of tulium fiber. So less burn back, something interesting. In terms of uh, laser fiber for the breakage, uh, we have also less breakage of the fiber when the fiber is completely deflected into the lower pole. So something also uh, interesting. Regarding the endoscopes, uh, very comparable to holmium, it means that uh, if you see the fiber uh, on the screen, when you activate the tulium fiber, it's completely safe for the endoscope. Huh? It's completely comparable to holmium. You see the fiber, you are safe for the uh, endoscope. Regarding the temperature changes, uh, it was also demonstrated and published. There's no difference. I mean, it's uh, uh, no more, no less compared to holmium huh? when you increase the temperature into the kidney. Then we have additional benefits. It's much, much lighter, six times less for tulium fiber. You don't need a specific equipment to connect uh, the laser. Uh, uh, just a regular uh, plug uh, is fine. The efficiency, the wall plug efficiency is much more superior with the tulium fiber. And it explains why there is no need for a big cooling system for the, the system and the, the reason why the, the system is actually much more compact and also less noisy compared to high power holmium. If you compare to low power, the noise is really similar. Huh? But if you compare to high power system, it's really less uh, noisy actually. In terms of clinical experience, uh, the Russian colleagues, huh, as you know, they were the first actually to publish uh, if you ask uh, uh, Sechenov University or Professor Markov, they uh, demonstrate that they were really faster compared to Olmium technology. That's also the experience uh, for many, many new users, including uh, ourselves uh, actually. But I think to uh, really demonstrate this, we will have to consider some uh, uh, objective parameters like the joule per cubic millimeter and the, the cubic millimeter per second, just to demonstrate that we are going faster for uh, holmium yag. Just few examples, we tweet uh, some of these uh, examples recently to demonstrate that tulium fiber is definitely faster uh, in our practice huh, if we compare to what we are doing uh, with uh, um, holmium yak. Huh? That's the comparison. Dr. Paleoster uh, recently uh, tested the, the technology and he just confirmed, like uh, many of us, that it's much faster by uh, using a tulium fiber. Uh, another example, I will, I will move to uh, uh, my last slide. Um, it's also possible to uh, have tissue application to incise. Uh, into the collecting system. So for example, if you have a calicial diverticulum, it's completely feasible with the tulium fiber and the incision is really, really precise. Uh, personally, I think it's even more precise than holmium. We will have to confirm again this feeling, but it seems to be a very, very uh, interesting. Uh, somebody asked also regarding the bubbles. It's true that when you activate actually the, the tulium fiber, you create a lot, a lot of small bubbles. It's disturbing a little bit. Uh, my trick actually is just to increase a little bit irrigation with my uh, hand uh, assisted device, just to flush the, the small bubbles. But it's true that it's a, it's a small, small concern actually. Tulium fiber, it's not only for stones, huh? it works perfectly for BPH, but also for conservative treatment of urotelial tumor. So it seems actually that this technology will probably, probably replace holmium yak technology. 
Again, even we like Holmiomiac technology, it's a very beautiful equipment, but it seems that Tulium fiber will be probably superior. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Olivier, for always a very nice uh, presentation and, and very exciting data on this uh, new lasers. We have some uh, questions for you, Olivier. Uh, first one is, uh, um, what is the maximum time you can, uh, for, for doing a, a retrograde into renal stone procedure? What is your limit? Yeah. Yeah, I think it's a good question, Pale, because many people are asking regarding this side. Personally, I don't really like if it's more than one hour, 30 minutes, maximum, maximum two hours. So for me, the recommendation is that if you respect this time, you need to learn uh, by yourself what you are able to do in one hour, 30 or two hours. Maybe it's only 10 millimeters stone, okay? But you have to accept this. Uh, if you are better, you, maybe you will be able to go for 15 or 20 millimeters stone, but you need really to evaluate yourself personally to know exactly what you can do. And the guidelines, they are very nice, but I don't think the guidelines uh, can fit with all, all the surgeons, actually. No, I completely agree. I think uh, one and a half hour is, is, is sort of also my limit. But, but of course, this can be personalized as, as anything. Some patients are more fragile and, uh, and you have to consider that as well. Exactly. Just another question here, Olivier. Um, with this, uh, with this uh, new laser, uh, we have talked uh, a lot about you know, popcorning, pop dusting, dusting, uh, fragmenting with, with the Hallium laser. What, what are the settings? Are there any difference in settings for, for this new Tulium fiber laser? Yeah, I, I think, and it will be, you know, the main message we will have to give to the people in the, in the future. First, we still need to learn, you know. I'm not sure that what I'm doing today with this Tulium fiber, I will do it next year. I, I don't know, you know, we need to, to, to uh, confirm what we have seen in the lab, what the people from Russia, from India, they, they use it for more than one year. So we will have really to, uh, to, to understand what is the best setting. For sure, um, you need to understand that if you're using smaller fiber to dust, you will have to use very low energy. Uh, it's nothing compared to Halmia. The, the level of energy will be much lower. And because of this, you produce very small, small pieces. So the vision is not too bad. The reason why you can use more frequency to go faster. But again, there's some limit on that. So actually, the system available um, gives some uh, presetting. I think the presetting looks okay. Uh, so when you start with this kind of system, I, I think you can go and use the, the presetting actually and just modulate the presetting if you are not completely happy with, uh, with the effect. Exactly. That's, that's also my experience with, with the few cases that I have done that you should actually you should start rather low and then, then you should just play with the laser see see what happens because because the, the range of this laser is so yeah. big that, that actually you, you you can you can attack any kind of stone. And you know so, Palette, or, just regarding the setting uh, uh, because we already we discussed before together and I think it's also a very strong message. We really have to mention this is regarding these high frequency possibilities. Uh, all the people said it's beautiful because we can use this high frequency, it's going very fast. It's true, but be careful. Uh, if you're using too much pulses, so too much frequency, especially into the ureter, uh, just to give you an example, if you're using 100 hertz, so 100 pulses per second, it's a lot it's impossible to control 100 pulses in one second, meaning that you will lose some of them uh, and you will touch the mucosa and you will damage, you will damage the ureter and create a, a possible stenosis. So my recommendation really is into the kidney, yes, you can move with a, a high frequency, but into the ureter, please don't use too much frequency. Keep the frequency low to be very precise. I think this is a very important point. Just, just going to, to, the, to the ureteroscopes, um, 
there's, there's a question here whether you prefer uh, a regular um, UV scope or a single use scope. Do you have any considerations here? Any, any thoughts, ideas? Re regarding the combination with laser, you mean? Or, yeah. or just? Uh, uh, of course, you know, uh, my first choice uh, is single use endoscope if I have to treat a very challenging cases. I mean, if I know that I will force my scalp, uh, I have a big risk to damage my regular scalp and I love my regular scalp, I will not use them. I will use a single use one because I know that if I force the scalp, there's a big risk to damage the endoscope and also to damage because of laser, laser fiber breakage, for example. So for me, uh, actually, I select single use uh, for challenging cases. For the rest, I, I use the regular one. Yep. Another question here is, we, we, we talked a lot about dusting and also a little bit about fragmenting. So, uh, and, and we want to have the fragments uh, or the dust as small as possible. How do you measure the size of the remaining fragments during surgery? Yes, so we have three possibilities for that. First, you can obtain um, an X-ray. Uh, you do a, during the, the, the surgery with the fluoroscopy, you can take a picture. So if you see the stone, the fragments, uh, it means that it's probably relatively big. And you can compare to the size of the endoscope because the, on, the, on the fluoroscopy, you see the scalp and you see the fragments. You know that the, 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 um, the endoscope is 8.5 8 French, so it means 2.5 to 3 uh, millimeter. So you can make the comparison. Second possibility is to use the laser fiber and you compare the size of the laser fiber with the, the fragments. But don't forget that when you are using a, a surgical laser fiber, for example, 200 micron, the blue part is in fact more or less the double. So I mean 400. Huh? So don't be, don't be confused thinking it's, uh, it's uh, smaller. And the last possibility is if you are using a safety guide wire, you know that the size of the guide wire is one millimeter. So if you compare the guide wire with the fragments, you estimate the size of the fragments. That's a very good point. Um, with these new lasers, you, you, you perform a lot of dust. Do you uh, ever perform aspiration? And how and when do you do it? You, you, you're right, Palais, I think that's actually the point, you know, we are super happy to produce such dust, you know, more dust compared to Holmium, but we still have the same problem. What can we do actually to aspirate, to remove the dust? And to be honest, actually, we can not do anything different compared to Holmium. We have exactly the same situation. The, the, the real dust um, probably will evacuate by uh, itself because it's really light. But of course, we still have small fragments, a little bit more than 250 microns probably. And for these fragments, actually, it's impossible to do anything. We still, we, we are still in the same situation. It means that actually we need a new equipment and, and, and I'm sure it will be the next step coming very soon. Uh, I mean, a vacuum, a cleaner system just to aspirate the dust. Yeah, so this, this, this will, this have to be, it has to be the focus of, of, uh, of new developments. Uh, actually, I'm actually, I did a, I did a, I did a, a uric acid stone the other day, a rather large one uh, with, with the thulium, and it was really, really fine dust. And I tried just with, with, with the syringe just to aspirate, and it was amazing that this in the syringe that yeah, was completely. Yeah, yeah, sure. So, so, so actually, you, you are getting uh, much smaller uh, dusting dust particles. Absolutely. To the, so this is very exciting. So new technology in this this area. We're, we're looking forward to that. We've yeah. talked about, we've talked a lot about dusting. There's a question here. Uh, do you ever do fragmentation extraction? Uh, and, and what do you think about this yeah. technique? I think we, we should not forget fragmentation actually. You know, the, the principle, if you fragment and you are able to remove all the fragments, it means that the patient is stone free. So it's, it's a perfect technique. The problem is that if you treat stone bigger and bigger, as you know, it's exponential. If you fragment, because you need to, to produce small pieces, three, four millimeters, 
uh, you will have uh, uh, hundreds and hundred pieces, and then it becomes uh, impossible to basket all the pieces. So personally, what I'm doing, if the stone is more or less less than 10, 10, 12, 12 millimeter max, huh? uh, I prefer to basket and to, uh, to fragment and to basket. But if the stone is more than 10, my preference actually is what you said before, dusting first, uh, and maybe I keep just the center for basketing. Yeah, so have something for, for analysis. And, and of course, we, we, we need basketing for the stone uh, analysis, you're right. right. I completely agree. In the literature, there has some bit, some debate whether uh, dusting or uh, fragmenting, extracting is, is, is the best. I think it's not one or the other. It's, it's both, and you have, again, to personalize. And, and in, in, in the big stone scenarios, you have to do both. It's, it's uh, popcorning, whatever, all, all, all modalities. You, you, you mean, Palais, that if it's not like this, it's like that? Exactly. <laughs> that is rule number one in endurology <laughs> and also in life, actually. That's one question here, whether you could use urethral access sheet in infants? Um, children? Uh, for children? Yeah. Uh, I don't really like to use ureteral access sheet for children, I must say. You know, I prefer to use my endoscope as small as possible uh, to respect the anatomy. So it means that fiber optic, huh? so it means no single use, huh? not, uh, not uh, for all my pediatric patients. I prefer to use my fiber optic. They are much smaller. Even the vision is not so good, much smaller. And of course, to have less risk, I irrigate very slowly, very gently. If you do that, the pressure into the kidney is fine, and there is no need for an access sheet to decrease the pressure. It takes maybe more time, huh? but yep. uh, it's a children. You need to take time to be very precise, very delicate. So no access sheet. Uh, I prefer my fiber optic one to respect the anatomy, and I irrigate very, very gently. Good. Uh, another question regarding uh, the fiber size. Do you recommend the small fiber uh, for, for all uh, your ureteroscopic procedures? Actually, you know, f so you mean uh, flexi and rigid? Uh, for my yeah, rigid yeah. endoscope, of course, my working channel is bigger, so I'm able to use a bigger laser fiber, 365, for example, or 270 or 365. But uh, when I'm using my Flexi, I much prefer to use the, the smallest uh, uh, fiber. So with Holmium, I use something between 200, 270. That's the smallest one. But with the Tullium fiber, I much prefer the 150. I have seen uh, in the last days a lot of discussion on Twitter regarding what is the size. People say 200. Actually, my preference is 150, I must yeah. say. Yeah, but, but with the new fibers, you have, you have to get used to the, the very, very small, delicate fibers. You, you, you yeah, cannot right. almost seal it. But, but yeah. once you get used to it, it it's, uh, it's very nice. You get it's, less rich repulsion and, and, and better yeah. irrigation. Uh, and smaller pieces. As, as, as you told us. Yeah. Um, any comments? There's another question here. Any comments on... on uh, uh, on the laser fibers, single use or reusable fibers? Uh, you, you know, the, 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 the question is very easy. It's a question of cost. You know, if you have to save money, if it's, uh, you are somewhere, it's a bit difficult, you have to save money, no discussion. Uh, use the reusable one. Be careful when you re-sterilize. You need to have a good team for that. But if, if it's the case, then it's okay. It's cost effective. If you are working somewhere uh, it's possible to buy the single use, uh, then it's much easier. You know, all the time you have a new fiber, no risk to have any breakage uh, or less breakage. So of course that's the best. That's what we do now. For a long time, we were using the reusable one and I was happy with, uh, but I must say that since we switch completely for the single use fiber actually, I must say that it's much more convenient and we have no questions regarding, uh, regarding the maintenance of the fiber. So the question is, it depends for you regarding the cost. Yeah. So Olivia, we have a lot of questions, but I think we only have two, time for two left. Uh, one okay. question is here, 
uh, on, on different uh, stone types, different stone compositions, any uh, pr uh, preferred settings for different uh, for laser settings for different stone types? You know, it's an excellent question, Pale, and that's a problem actually when we are using laser, uh, holmium or tulium, you know. It means that the companies actually, they are coming with presetting. And when you uh, open the system, you see dusting fragmentation. But the problem is that it's one fixed setting for all type of stones. I mean, uric acid, monohydrate or dihydrate, you know, and it doesn't work like that. So that's exactly what you said before. You did a uric acid stone, it's uh, a soft one, uh, and you need a special settings to uh, produce the dust, but this uh, setting is not the same if you have to treat monohydrate or dihydrate or cysteine star. So the pre-setting, as we said before, they are okay, but you have to think that uh, if you're not happy with what you create with the pre-setting, you have to change a little bit. You have to play a little bit with the setting. And remember that to go thinner, finer or to have a, a bigger fragments, you have to play with the pulse duration and the energy. And if you would like to play with the speed, to go fast or to go slow, you have to play with frequency. Uh, frequency is to accelerate energy and pulse duration is to create uh, dust or to create fragments. Excellent. Really, you should play with the laser to personalize treatment. Just one final question. Um, what about thulium lasers in percutaneous surgery or for bladder stones? I think it will be probably a super interesting to use it because it's possible to use big, bigger fiber, uh, uh, 550 microns or, or even more, even more like uh, up to uh, one millimeter, a little bit less than one millimeter. So it's a good point because Again, if you think about the energy density, if you have a bigger stone, you have more surface in contact with the stone. But to take the advantage, you need to put much more energy inside. Otherwise, the energy is dilutes. But with the thulium fiber, it's possible to go up to six joules. So it means that you will be able to keep the same energy density with a bigger fiber. So very useful for bladder stone very useful for PCNL or mini PCNL, no discussion. Thank you very much. I think this was the, the last question. There's a lot of questions in here and that's demonstrating that there's a lot of interest into this uh, field and that's, that's very exciting because I think we are in a very exciting period for, for uh, yeah. this technology. Olivia, do I have some final words for, uh, for the... No. Um, again, I would say um, probably like a take home message. I think in endourology, uh, you need first to know perfectly the guidelines, as you said, guidelines indications. This is very important. The second point, you need to know perfectly your equipment. You need to know what you are able to do with the equipment. I think there's something you need to learn. And my last recommendation would be you need to learn uh, you need to evaluate yourself, what you are able to do regarding the, the, the patients. Thank you very much. Okay. And thank you, thank you all for joining thank us. Thank you, Palais, and thank you Exciting. all, uh, exactly. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Palais. It was nice thank to you. see you, thank really. Bye-bye. Okay. Nice